series of nine videotapes provides an opportunity to share in a unique experience where Stafford Beer introduces an audience to the world of managerial cybernetics. The event took place over five days in July 1994 at the Falkendale Hotel near Lampeter in Mid Wales. It was organised by the Liverpool Business School at John Moores University, where Stafford is Honorary Professor in Organisational Transformation and a Senior Fellow. The aim was to provide a video learning resource by recording discussions between Stafford and an audience that had little or no previous knowledge of the subject. Over the course of the event, Stafford explains the development of the subject from the initial scientific discovery of cybernetics. Through his own development of managerial cybernetics, he introduces the tools and models that he has created to offer an alternative approach to conventional management practice. The resulting material embraces the key principles and models that have previously been introduced in his 13 books and referred to in many of his published papers. This is the first learning resource where all these have been brought together in one integrated way. Managerial cybernetics continues to be the only available scientific and coherent account of effective managerial practice. Stafford provides numerous anecdotes applications and insights from the perspective of practitioner, manager and scientist. The session covers two topics. Firstly, Stafford completes the discussion of viability with reference to the work of Umberto Maturana and the concept autopoiesis, which literally translates as to make yourself. The process of autopoetic homeostasis allows an organization to maintain its identity whilst experiencing changes in structure, appearance, and etc. The session then moves on to its main topic, Stafford's new invention called Syntegration. There is a huge disparity in the nature of systems three and four, and yet they have to be brought together. Stafford invented Syntegration as a prime mechanism for strengthening the interactions and communications in the crucially important three-four homeostat. As reported in Beyond Dispute, the invention of team Syntegrity, this invention was influenced in part by the work of Buckminster Fuller, who formulated the idea that everything in nature exists in a balance between the forces of compression and tension. Fuller's comment to Stafford that all systems are polyhedra and his invention of the geodesic dome based on the structure of the icosahedron encouraged Stafford to consider polyhedra structures as the basis for a model of how groups can achieve synergy. Stafford shows that mapping the group's ideas onto an icosahedral model can generate a natural reverberation as ideas are generated and bounce around, being modified and changed. This integration avoids the damaging effects of hierarchy by structuring the conversations around the icosahedral sphere. 
Spafford leads the group in building their own icosahedron models using fruit pastels and cocktail sticks. These are then used to explain how this integration process works and how current action research continues to extend knowledge and understanding. Would anybody care to suggest what it is that characterizes life? How would you recognize life? <laughs> Cathedrals sustained, not live. <laughs> Cathedral. Sustained, but it isn't alive. I don't think sustain sustained is what we're going to work. Burning oxygen. Burn? I'm not hearing you. Oh, I see. Well, um, what about plants? They burn nitrogen. Oh. <laughs> but, but <laughs> no, you're not. You're not saying the thing that most people say which is quite interesting to me. I wonder why not. Change. That's not right either, you see. Well, change, yes, but cathedrals fall down and that's a change. Yeah. Ah, that's the one. That's what... I'm sorry, J Jane, I didn't hear you. <laughs> um, most people say repro uh, self-reproduction. Well, the very, very eminent Chilean biologist, uh, Umberto Maturana, who is also a very eminent cybernetician, uh, examined this question and said it's nothing to do with self-reproduction, it is to do with self-production. And that's what also poiesis means. Poio is the Greek verb to make. So poiesis is to make and autopies is to make yourself. And the reason I was reminded of this was I, I was remarking earlier um, in another session on um, the fact that our bodies renew themselves every seven years but we maintain the relationships between cells and bits and pieces in general. Well, what Maturana realized was that uh, Life is characterized by the ability to do just that. So if, you, if you're going to last 70 years, you've got to renew all your stuff 10 times. Now that's a very odd thing to be able to do because it involves, um, well, it, DNA is in there pitching, isn't it? It's got, you've, got, you've got to reproduce all the bits and pieces according to a blueprint. And once you get that clear, you perceive that... Um, that self-reproduction is a special case of autopoiesis. That one of the things you do to make yourself is have offspring to take over when you've died. So the notion of autopoiesis is, is really much more fundamental. And uh, he makes a, a wonderful case for this. Now why, why am I supposed, why am I uh, offering this as something that should interest you in the context of this week. Well, how much effort do you think a viable system should spend on autopoiesis? I mean, you can't do it for nothing. It's, it's got to use energy and information and all sorts of things. And for years I thought there must be a magic number somewhere, sort of 17% of the effort or something of this sort would be required to produce this autopoietic effect. And then I soon realized that couldn't possibly be right because it depends <laughs> you know, on a lot of things. Now, I have now got a solution to this. The element of the viable system which produces itself is system one. And in support of that function are two, three, four, and five. They're there to see system one carrying on doing its thing. Now that arises a very, a very interesting uh, speculation. Who has seen uh, the computer department 
trying to be a viable system or the engineering department or maintenance department all sorts of these things that are not system ones try to be viable systems and seize power by doing so right we've we've seen it all the time bureaucracies do this typically and so I invented the even worse term, and I, I would love a better one, of pathological autobiases, which is a terrible great mouthful, to stand for a viable system in which either or all of systems 2, 3, 4 and 5 were running amok trying to be viable systems. And you know enough about this now that I realized I could offer this explanation in quite a short time, which you couldn't from cold. Uh, we have been talking about the pathology of organizations. We haven't used the word, but a great deal we've said what goes wrong and why. Well, I, I like this explanation very much, and it, it certainly uh, accounts for an awful lot that's going wrong today, I think, in, in, in our kind of society, because... Uh, bureaucracy does get the upper hand and the changes in the health service and the education service outstandingly seem to me to be pathologically autopoietic in a very big way and what a nice explanation instead of you know we've got some some explanatory power in this thought instead of just saying oh damn bureaucrats they're at it again you know you you can see why and we, we know from all our studies of, uh, of uh, bureaucracy that, that that is exactly what people are doing. They're preserving their future, they're giving themselves huge pensions, index linked and God knows what. Ministers can come and go and do, fortunately. And the dear old permanent civil service collects a K and carries on as before. Not his job to do that, you know, his job is to help his minister. Seems as if that's the last thing some of them are actually intending to be doing. Hmm. Find that interesting? Sure. Moderately, Chris. These, these um, systems that, well, that think they're system one, they're mm. in actuality not system one. Don't they still need to renew themselves? But is, is it that they should be renewed in the process of helping the system once renewed? renew them? That's right. They, they renew themselves as far as required and not for their own sake. No, That's the key. in the process of renewing what their purpose is to renew. Right. Right. But that means that an awful lot of things that are set up by senior management, just to use a, an ordinary popular phrase, um, have built into them pathological autopoiesis when what they ought to have built into them is destruct. There are an awful lot of things that you set up which ought to have written in I am going to self-destruct when I've done my job like a, a specialized committee to do something and somehow or another these committees stay there forever and get called quangos and everybody starts getting paid which wasn't the original idea at all. You know the sort of thing I mean. So, well, I'm, I'm sorry that this, this, this hasn't got much continuity to it. I just wanted to add, add that to our last session. And this session really is to be devoted to this new invention, which I call Syntegrity. And I'm offering it to you, it's a lot of things, but I'm offering it to you in the context of this week uh, as a prime mechanism for pulling off this 3-4 homeostasis that is such a problem. Now, I, I hope I convinced you it's a problem, and I haven't offered you any kind of solution because there, there really isn't one in the book anywhere. All we can do is say, well, hold meetings or watch it or something of that sort. There's no actual technique. Well, disintegration is such a technique, and it, it derives from this idea. We all know about the term flat management. We don't. <laughs> well, it's one of the... We certainly all know about the disappearance of middle management and the 
the the loss of hierarchy the the idea that hierarchy is very old-fashioned we don't need it so flat management means you go like this uh, but it's very hard to to control and my favorite story about flat management is uh, when I was called on by Ottawa the the federal government of Canada to look at the plans for uh, the, the new and they were one of the first countries in the world to do this a long time ago uh, the new ministry of uh, of environment that's right and and what they did was gather all the stuff in the government that dealt with that and put it under a minister and they didn't like hierarchies as befits environmentalists you see so I measured the room in which I knew I had to speak to the to the, st the senior government people and I, I had a sheet of a roll of paper like Buckley's and uh, I drew this organization chart <laughs> So it just went from wall to wall, and I, I said, this is your new organization as proposed. And I pinned it on there, and I walked right across the room with it and said, 36 people directly responsible to the minister. Now, you see, you've only got to, to show this diagram, and everybody's falling about, and they say, we can't have suggested that. Yes, you have. That's what it comes down to. <laughs> so how can you get structure? in a group of let's say 30 people uh, without hierarchy when you don't want people to pull rank or gender or anything you want to treat them as human beings well now the answer to this would seem to be that you close the system round in a three-dimensional space so that you've got something like a ball and you roll a ball along the ground obviously there's no top to this ball or sideways or bottom or anything it's just a ball now do we have something uh, available to us that that has that kind of character and the answer is the icosahedron at least that's the answer i've picked there are reasons for that now who knows what an icosahedron is even <laughs> 20, Greek icosa, yes. You were going to say the same thing, Lindsay? Yeah, well, fair enough. So what are these sides like? Pentagons? No. Triangles. They're equilateral triangles. That's nice, you see, because we want this concept of equality. So all the sides are the same, and they've all got three... Uh, lines round them all the same length now I find it is immensely hard to talk about this because we were all brought up in a two-dimensional culture when you think about it our, our notion of three dimensions is somebody teaching us perspective and saying you know the lampposts get nearer together and, so, and this kind of stuff and we don't really have a feeling for space now I think that we shan't get very far unless I can give you a feeling for icosahedral space. Now I've just written this book, which is hard going, you see. So what I propose to do is to make you make an icosahedron each. So that's what this is. Now, these are you, this is your kit. <laughs> this is your kit. Spread those around. <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> Do not eat this Aww. yet. Everybody eats the Anybody else? Sorry, 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 a ball like structure with 20 equal faces out of this? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah you will do me a Not easy, you know. Um, 
Well, now, the next question, you see, is how many edges does it have? Well, it's got 20 faces, those are flat, but they're delineated by edges, obviously. So how many of those have we got? Many of them are <laughs> <there. laughs> <laughs> no, no. There are 30. And there's 30 cocktails, see? <laughs> so the next question is, how many nodes, as we call them, has the system got? Those are the points from which the thing radiates. <laughs> ah, we caught you there, didn't we? Because there are extras to uh -huh. so your pride. <laughs> <laughs> there, there should be two extra gumdrops and two extra sticks, because sometimes sticks break. Yeah, people trying to force their way through life, you think, I haven't got any more Now, do you want to try to do this, or do you want me to give you help? Uh, you'll, try try to you'll try and do it, yeah? It's cold. Right. I don't know what principles of your genius brain are. <laughs> <laughs> Need a bit of editing on this film, I think. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 Let me give you a clue. I told you there are 30 edges, and there are 12 nodes. 12 nodes? So that tells you something. What is the relationship between an edge and a node? <laughs> Electric light bulbs going on over people's heads. I'm not scared. switched on. Mm -hmm. Well, so to try and answer that, we've got uh, 12 nodes and 30 edges, and the thing's regular, it's uniform. Yeah. Um, You're getting there. Both of you are thinking this one out. How many nodes, sir? Twelve. Twelve. Six into each node. Twelve. Yeah, of course. Dug a pit and fell straight in. <laughs> have you have you got the maths right now, uh, Glenn? Yeah. Have you done this before, Claire? <laughs> Yeah, I feel bit hard. I certainly thought you looked at your head. Why do you learn something like that? Because he told my dad. Like <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 So I think the time has come for those who are wrestling to so need to show you how to do it. Yes, you've got, you've got, um, we're dealing in five, you see, as we just said, because the, the 12 nodes, which means 60 connections, which means five a node. So, so what you should do, if you put five jellies on the floor as a pentagon and join them together, that's the first thing. Which means you that your, your angles, the angles, <laughs> the angles will form themselves. <laughs> the nice thing about the jellies is they're fairly elastic and uh, Look, you want you want five. Yeah. Well, it's supposed to make a ring. Yeah. 
Oh, that's right. I'm sorry. I was looking at the one you just done. Join those together. Join those together. Now, your problem is you're stuck in a two-dimensional space then. You see? That's it. That's it. I see. Yeah. Now, you, you make one of those, maybe you make another. It's the, it's the trick. I'm trying to do it without getting them sticky. I have to eat these later. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, I'm pressing myself to uh, catch and proceed getting all that. Now, you take a jelly and hold it up in the air in the middle. That's right, well, you put the thing back on the ground, so okay. just suspend the jelly, right. that's right. right, and now you want five connections to the right. five other okay. jelly. Yeah. So yeah. the thing looks a bit like a spider. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Has anyone here ever seen a Krypton factor? Yeah, yeah. Hey, that's a good one. Oh, I see that. Right. <laughs> mm. mm. Yeah. 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 So you make two, two of those kind of caps for yeah. 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 Wicked fruit balls and the Yeah, it's a Right. Yeah, make another. <laughs> Yeah, so I thought it was exactly the same. Thank you. Made it? Well done, Lindsay. Oh, it. Oh, good. Huh? Okay. That's Dave's got there. Carbon six, isn't it? Yes. My husband he sings the Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. oh, oh, yeah. oh, 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 <laughs> You're doing good. Go back to work with someone. Happy? Yeah. It's a fun thing, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, you, you don't have, you see what I like, you could make, you don't have any experience with this sort of thing, and it's, it's quite amazing that it suddenly creates a stable structure in front of your eyes out of this bag of tricks. I think it still delights me, that's right. I certainly agree that as a model of democracy, you see, we've got something here because every edge is a person. Yes, so I said there were 30 people and of course there they are and they're arranged in such a form that they have quite a lot of structure but nobody is better than anybody else. Obvious, isn't that? They're all absolutely equivalent. Pardon? <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm very attracted to that idea, and um, and so I started doing a whole lot of experiments with, with people and trying to work out how to make use of this. Now, in the context of the viable system model, I've been talking about the 3-4 homeostat. I'm sorry, I'd better get on because most people have finished. Um, talking about 3-4 homeostat, and we already discovered that System 3 and System 4 are really rather different beasts uh, because one is, is uh, well, certainly self-perceives as being nitty-gritty, getting on with the job, making the profits. Whereas System 4 is spending the profits, that's System 3 version of System 4. <laughs> system 4 version is we are the enlightened ones and you guys are all stuck in the mud doing this stuff. So there is a huge disparity uh, in the flavour of these two systems. Now, we've got to get them together. Now then.
supposing you get 15 representatives of three and 15 representatives of four and put them in a pot and stir them up and create this structure. Pretty nice, you know? But then we're left with the question, well, what are they going to do? And besides, do you hang them from the ceiling? I mean, how do you, how do, you do this? Now, you can very nearly hang them from the ceiling. Uh, one of our collaborators makes this thing with five-foot sides, and um, it fills the room, of course, if you think about it. If one of those sides is five feet, it's uh, quite a big structure. And everybody gets inside it and has their photographs taken, and it, it's good fun. <laughs> So, now we ask the following question. If one person is a side, then that person is connected to two nodes. Hmm? Now, the nodes are going to be the topics under discussion, the topics we consider important. Twelve is a pretty convenient number, because if you have fifty, you never get to the bottom of the agenda. Twelve you can just about handle. Less than 12 turns into a motherhood statement if you're not careful of the kind we are going to make a profit or something. You know, we were criticizing those things earlier. 12 is pretty nice. And don't worry that it's arbitrary because, of course, it's a question of editing in order to get 12 decent statements. So I'm going to talk to you in a minute about how you get them, but in the meantime, I want you to understand the structure. So we've got 12 statements and any one person is connected to two of those statements and is part of two teams therefore each of five look at it that's why you got it so if you hold one strut then you can see if that's you uh, in Jane's case she's a member of green and a member of black and that means that we're controlling variety already because she hasn't got to be on 12 committees, she's on two committees. Hmm? <laughs> What's got into you, Karen? <laughs> Well, now, somebody mentioned uh, Buckminster Fuller in, in the context of the carbon-60. He didn't live to see the, the invention of that molecule, you know? No, it's quite, quite extraordinary. He, what did he become famous for, most notably? Pun? No, 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 no. Geodesic dome, yeah. Geodesic construction. And let me explain that to you. Architecture has always been able to span about 160 feet and whatever the materials it tends to fall in the dome falls in if it gets bigger both St Peter's in Rome and St Paul's in London are about 160 feet and even then they both have huge wrought iron chains around the bottom did you know that to stop them going splat <laughs> so that is always accepted as limiting factor and Bucky bust that you can, you can build a Buckminster Fuller dome of any size. You could put one over London if you could afford it. Now, how's it done? What's the trick? He had to invent a whole new mathematics to handle this, and everybody said he was mad, and so he had a most extraordinary fellow. And I was very happy to, to know him, and, um, and his thinking stuck very much in my mind. So to dispense with the carbon atom, when, they, when the chemists realized that this was in fact a Buckminster Fuller type of construction, they named the carbon-60 atom Buckminster Fullerene. All one word, tremendous long word, generally referred to as buckyballs, right? Yeah. So, how did he do this? Well, now there's a nice little secret in here, which is a bit irrelevant to our managerial purposes, but I want you to understand what you're dealing with here. For some reason, architects have always understood the principle of compression. So they build things that stay in place because they push down using gravity. So you can build two pillars there and they don't fall over because of the, uh, the mass is, is directed by gravity 
downwards. Then how the hell do you build an arch? Well, it took a long time, if you look at Stonehenge and so on, it took a long time to get the principle of building the arch. And oddly enough, that's still compression, as you know. The keystone holds the arch together by pushing down, oddly enough. So, practically all our building, all our structures, come about because of compression. And Buckminster Fuller realized that this isn't true in nature. Now, in nature, compression is always matched by something else. What do you think that is? Tension, precisely. And we can see that with our arch, because by the time it's been there 2,000 years and is beginning to <laughs> fall down, <laughs> splay out or something, you put a thin stainless steel rod across the top and hope nobody can see it, and that sucks it in. That's tension. So Fuller said, well, everything in nature that I can see is a mixture of these two things. And he looked at trees, and he looked at all sorts of of natural structures. And you can't actually falsify this. And there's a very nice little image that uh, of trying to falsify it. You take a tug of war team, both of whom are pulling like mad. So this, this rope is under tension. Well, where's the compression? Doesn't seem to be any. But you see, if before the team starts, you wiggle your finger between the strands of the rope and then they pull it, you'll soon find out where the compression is. Have your finger off. <laughs> and that is a beautiful example of, of the way the natural system mixes it. Well, what this thing does, the structure as you have it is, is pretty, pretty well a compressive structure using the principles like the keystone in the arch to hold itself together. But if you put things inside it, then you can produce tension. For instance, if you just lend me that, uh, you find it up there. I, I, if I ran a, a wire between those two, it's already stable and pretty strong. But if I ran a wire across there, obviously going to be a damn sight stronger because the tension is going to suck it in and then you lean on top, it can't burst out sideways. Now, Buckminster Fuller was, was confronted with the problem that if you put up a, a dome or a building full of wires inside it, you wouldn't be able to use it. <laughs> so what he did, he divided this. Uh, 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 can you see this? There's another triangle there. And that's going to be uh, tension. If you take this as your base point, it, that is going to produce tension across that space. And then he gave it a bit of a third dimension by by treating this as a kind of skin. And just as you were building these things with the the top of the, <laughs> the spider being up in the air, uh, you get the same effect here. I think you can see that if you if you suspend a point where my finger is so that the wires come down a bit, again, you're increasing the tension. Now, with that trick, as I repeat, huge domes have been built, and, and he always contended that he could put one over a city, uh, because there's nothing to stop you once you've got this principle right. Well, this is a classic case of people saying the man's nuts, and then being totally falsified. They, years ago, when I, and he's been dead some time, when I, when I knew him, there were 200,000 domes around the world. <laughs> it's quite a lot for a nutter. <laughs> so, that was his principle. So I said to myself, now, here's my organization of 30 people, held together primarily by compressive strength. What shall I do about the tension? Because please recognize there is tension among people. And I don't mean anything really aggressive, you know. I'm not saying they're all having a bust up and fighting each other. But always in a human group, there, there is a, a, a certain tension going on, which is constructive, which is helping. Now, I have complicated reasons for not wanting to join these two. And I don't think I'll bother you with trying to explain, because that's pretty mathematical. What I joined together were these two. Now, that is to say, joining to the next but one neighbor. 
Can you see how many such lines there are on here? See, I would be joining this to that, to that, to that, to that. By, no, to that, sorry, it's hard to see. Um, how many are going to be? Three, three each level. Three. One, two. Oh no, I lost it, I lost it. It's hard to see in the right plane, isn't it? It's going to be five again, you see, because yeah. that's your pentagon there, and this yeah. is your pentagon yeah. here, and it's... So you've got five wires coming out of every node, joining up. So that's 60 again, only there's only 30, for the reason you discovered, Glenn, when you were tr trying to work out the nodes. Each has got two ends, you see. Now I said, OK, we, the, these connections must be recognised as tensile components of the system. So I called them critics. So let's go back to you, who were this person I'm hanging on to here is a member of two critic, uh, two teams and will turn out to be a critic of two more. Now there are reasons why in practice you can't be a critic of more than two others. It has to do with how meetings are held and so on. Uh, if you d You're like a member of a team that's, a, that's a two away from another one then you're automatically a critic. Yeah. You're automatically a critic of two other teams. Yeah. One in this capacity and the other in that capacity, you see. Now look at what's happening to the variety equation. It's quite interesting because you are now dealing with four of the nodes in two different capacities out of a total of 12, quite directly. Two as team members, two as critics, and as to the rest, you're part of the whole show. Maybe you can go and see what they're doing. Maybe they will tell you what they're doing. So what we need now is what I call the protocol. That is to say, a way of conducting affairs with this model, which will enable all these things to happen. Now, that's more difficult than it sounds. <laughs> took me some years to, to work this out. And what it involves is a succession of meetings with various different purposes, which I will try to outline to you. But you, you need to have the architecture in the back of your mind to understand the explanation. Now, when we, when we assemble, I, I call this a syntegrity model, and I call this activity a syntegration because it is synergy, which means building up the power between people, you know that, and integration, which means it's cohesive. So a disintegration has got to begin, nobody knows who they are, <laughs> don't say it, <laughs> they don't know where who they are in terms of this diagram, and they don't know what the subjects are. Now, Look at the subjects issue. I, I have fought all my life against the standard way of running meetings because you have to choose an agenda. And when you've got the agenda, you more or less determine the outcome of the meeting, especially if you know all the people. You put the agenda in a certain order and a good secretary can write the minutes before the meeting's held. <laughs> this is not really clever. And all sort of experienced committee men know all the tricks. Sydney Webb used to, used to put the same item down at the beginning at the end, have all the row about it the first time, get it deferred, then when everybody was tired out and people were leaving, it would come up again and pass. So all this kind of trickery. Besides, there's a, there's a more compelling reason for not having a gender, namely, we don't know what we should be discussing in the first place. We always discuss the same old things. Now, Suppose we're discussing the future of the world, which some people here have tried to do using this model. Um, what are you going to discuss? Education, health, here we go again. It's all the usual stuff, you see. 
And, and again, you could, you could almost write it in advance, so that's not going to do. So the, the idea is to try and discover out of thin air what it is going to be worth your tr cracking at. Mm. So we start with something which I call the filter of importance. And the way this works is, just imagine we were the 30 people. If you're all schizophrenics, there'd be 30 of us just about. <laughs> um, I say to you, okay, before we go to bed, everybody write down something that matters on a card. And if you're brilliant and have two ideas that matter, have another card. <laughs> just a sentence, you see? And I, when I'm doing this, I always say, I was my first card, it says, pray. <laughs> well, that's not a bad idea, but it's not the usual thing that you meet on the agenda. Now, if you can be persuaded to get off your hobby horse, and again, I always say you may be the world's leading expert in sewage, then do not say we need better sewage systems. We know about that. You've been telling us this for years, and you're boring the pants off us. Try and think about something else, Glenn, for God's sake, than sewage, you see. So this way you try and capture ideas. Now, well, there's some very interesting numbers around here because these 30 people, when you do this at night and say, do this before you go to bed, uh, tend to generate about 130 statements, which means people are averaging for point something each, you know, which is nice. So now we've got all these statements, what do we get it now? Requisite variety, I mean, you are in a good position to evaluate all this as we go along. If you've got 120 important things to say, then that's quite a high variety arrangement, given that they're not going to be boring, if you can persuade people to do that. Now, I have a very special trick for trying to ensure that, and I'm not sure if we've mentioned this already in another context. We have. Negate it, right? So you're putting in your clever statement and then you say, hey, just a minute, if I say not, it won't work. I remember now I was giving you the example of there is a God and there is not a God and so on. Okay. Now, while you're all asleep, the staff will have to do something with all this mass of material. And they will shove it all into computers. And breakfast time next morning, you'll, you'll have the complete list. And before you start the next part of the program, you will have an idea of what everybody's saying. And some of these things will be boring. Some will be incomprehensible. Some may trigger ideas and say, well, I wonder. So now we go into what is called the problem jostle. And the problem jostle works like this. We have a single big room like this one, with tables and chairs all over the place. And you come in with your, your 130 statements. And you may have had some more by this time. You're not restricted. You may have triggered all sorts of other thoughts. So after breakfast, we're all in there. Now, what you are invited to do is to seize a table on which there is a kind of flagpole. And so let's suppose you are dead keen on one of these statements. Maybe your own or maybe somebody else's. You go to this table and you write on the flag, pray, or whatever it is, you know. Ban men, or various things come up, quite uniformly. <laughs> uh, and then you sit at the table and invite business. So somebody says, oh, uh, Karen is wishing to discuss this. I like Karen. She's bright, interesting subject. I'll go and join her. Now, you see, it's very important that you can see all this because other people are setting up other tables and there's only one rule about the problem jostle. That is to say that there's no politeness. That it's understood that you will walk around, leave groups, and you don't have to make excuses and say, I guess I have to make a phone call or something. <laughs> So if you're in a group here and it's getting boring and you can see somebody else with an interesting looking group and they're hammering the table and so on, you say, I think I'll join in that. And if nothing's interesting, you start a new one. 
No, I mean, what I would say to people about this is, if you're bored in, in, in a disintegration, you're in stupid fault, because nobody's telling you what to do. <laughs> Have you ever been to a meeting where everything was interesting? And here it's, it must be. Everything that's happening to you is interesting, because it's your own fault if it isn't. Now, out of this, we try to get what we call um, uh, agglomerated statements of importance. Now, these are more like paragraphs than sentences. We're beginning to, to massage our thoughts into shape. And by the way, we know we've got to end up with 12, but we're not trying to force things at this stage. But we're trying to shrink the variety and contain variety in, in more comprehensive topics, which are going to be the 12 topics. And that usually ends up with about about 25, somewhere between 20 and 30. So we, our variety is being attenuated. It's coming down from 130 to 30. But we still want to get to 12. So after that, we go into various other processes. And uh, I don't think there's time tonight to... You don't need it to get into all the details. But what we've got to do is to bring that number down to 12 and then to allocate the positions on the icosahedron and then to allocate the struts now you can see this is a very high variety problem now my doctoral student in Swansea who attacked this problem of how to do this last reduction which is called the hexadic reduction hexadic means six because this thing has six polar axes these, these pairs, it's either 12, no, 6, right? How are you going to do it? Now, as soon as she started this, she, she made, did the mathematics. There, there, are, um, there are 4 million ways of allocating, <laughs> allocating the subjects around this. <laughs> and factorial 30 times 4 million ways of allocating the people. In other words, the, rec the variety we have to deal with on this model is, is, is 30 times 29 times 28 down to 4 million times 4 million. It's unbelievably difficult. So obviously various things have to, have to uh, be taken into consideration here. And we have voting procedures. We say, well now folks, these are the topics, will you rank them? What do you most want to discuss? Mm -hmm. And so forth. And all of this. Now, um, Josephine has, has developed an algorithm which runs on the computer. And uh, the last time we did this, it... Uh, Thanks to the programming problems, we've got an hour to work this out. <laughs> That's the lunch hour after the problem jostle and before we start getting on with it all. And um, her algorithm made, um, I think I'm right in saying, 18,000 tests in the course of the lunch hour. Looking, it's a heuristic, you know, looking for the best fit. And and typically she's getting 95, 93% of the desirable outcome, which we can measure because you put your preferences down. So if, if you don't get any of them, you're going to be pissed off. And if you get them all, you, you're going to be very happy. So we can measure that. So good for her. And all this technology is developing all the time. But now we know you know who you are. Now, if you are this person, you are Ms. or Mr. Black Green, and you have a label with Black Green on it, and you also know that you are a critic of this and this. So you've got four colors up here, and the last time they did it, they, they made a bracelet with, uh, with, with these uh, beads on it, which is quite sweet. You haven't seen that? Yeah. And, uh, now we come eventually to what is called the outcome resolve where we are going to have a set of meetings. Now if these two teams that I'm holding meet simultaneously 
we can save a bit of variety because all the members of this team and all its critics are not members of this team or its critics which is jolly convenient so so what we can do is hold six meetings I mean six sessions each with two meetings in separate rooms oh gracias thank you look Dennis brought it thank you Dennis yes now we've got the fully fully played up model that's got all the critic lines in it as you can see and there are the colors so this is Ms. Silver Black and uh, and so on this is Mr. Orange Yellow and so on and now we know who the critics are going to be and you now have an identity expressed in these four dimensions a, a team membership critic membership so I was saying that what we're going to do is hold uh, six double sessions and in that time obviously we're going to get through all the possible meetings so if you think of it if you allow an hour for a meeting which you can't afford to probably as you'll find out uh, it takes a day to run through this uh, quite conveniently I'm just trying to give you the feel for it you you have six hours of work coffee breaks lunch dinner uh, quite a heavy day and you'll have got through what I call an iteration so that's one complete cycle now what happens if you do it again <laughs> you see? and again and again and again do you all go mad now you realize that all the time you move through this process you're adding to your information because you are going to other meetings and people are swapping ideas and something that I call reverberation builds up in this thing information reverberates ideas reverberate ethos it's quite quite strange and in short it something that looks a bit like a group consciousness emerges now by this I do not mean that we've all been locked up here for ages together and therefore we know who we are like this meeting yeah, I mean something more than that I mean some some higher level um, perception is emerging that we have generated and we all share in and if you want a three four homeostat you see this is just what you're trying for very very exciting now how many iterations <laughs> now this is where the math gets high, high powered and I think I asked somebody if they knew what an eigenvalue was so I knew whether I could use the word but I don't think anybody does so let's leave the mathematics <laughs> and, uh, an eigenvalue is a measure of the extent to which uh, uh, this machine can compute itself how about that for a definition and that's what it's trying to do because the conscious self-consciousness has to do with computing yourself observing yourself isn't it anyway that's why I had to write this whole book because it's 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 rather a big subject um, however by computing the eigenvalues and it's actually computing what they are I can demonstrate that 90 percent of information will have been shared after three iterations after four it's about 92 and after five it's about 95 <laughs> and the thing is an asymptotic curve you see you never actually get to a hundred percent and obviously it's becoming more and more boring for less and less payoff so so I cut it at three uh, because that's the formal mathematical statement that 90 percent of it has happened and that's that's a theory about this now given that all the people are real people and talking and having lunch and so on I think we make up the extra 10 percent fairly easily in practice so that's the outcome resolve and at the end of each iteration you've got 12 statements and they change next iteration the same topics but now the, 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 the content changes you see until you end up with the, the optimal statement at the end now my ideal for this is to take a day over each iteration which is three days 
You have to add a day for the problem jostle and then all the, uh, all the exotic reduction stuff and a day at the end to deal with it all. Then you've got a week, you see. Well, n managers won't do it. They won't go for a week. They'll go for a week of golf somewhere at the drop of a hat, but not to do anything serious <laughs> like planning the future of the company. And the extraordinary thing is, you see, that they would rather adhere to the old ways, which means setting up 17 committees, all of whom are trying to meet once a month for the next six years and arrive at no conclusion at all, and cost the absolute earth in opportunity costs, which nobody knows how to measure, so you, you pretend it doesn't exist. You pay, pay my company to do this, it's going to cost you, because you've got to put all that stuff in place, you have to have facilitators and so on. But it's a fraction of what you would be spending in these orthodox ways and not recognizing. So that's what it is. And this is pretty new. Uh, I, I, I don't know how many have been held by now. Something like 40, I think, all around the world. We've, it seems to work in every uh, ethnic uh, context. And gradually we're trying to build up a... A, a recognition that this is a good thing to do. Now, obviously, I've had to take enormous numbers of decisions all the way through this piece about, you know, arbitrary decisions, but as well informed as I can make them as a scientist. But all sorts of things could be varied, and so there's about a thousand doctoral theses <laughs> lined up in here if anybody wants one. <laughs> <laughs> We've got several running already. Where's Buckry got to? <laughs> um, and that's disintegration in a nutshell. How's the time? That wasn't bad. We've just about got through this in an hour. Do you use it like all the time? Like, you know, you said to them, I can't remember what you called it, on the first day, and then you have three days of working, I can give meetings, and I've been there a day. Oh, good gracious. Well, that depends why you're using it. I think if the company does that in the three, four homeostat, that's going to kick the company off on a, on a new track. And then you've got to monitor that behavior, and then you say it's time for another. Well, we haven't had it long enough to know how long that would be, but I shouldn't think more than once a year is, makes any sense at all. <laughs> Yeah, well, that is a, a major problem. Now, yeah. another, another group of doctoral students are trying to deal with using other platonic solids than the icosahedron, but unfortunately the mass isn't nearly as satisfying. I mean, you, I, I've done this with a cube and a... And a octahedron, a tetrahedron, which is the smallest of them, and a dodecahedron. Now I've got them all listed. <laughs> uh, interestingly, the reason that Bucky Fuller gave to me and to others too, um, as to how he began working on this, when he was a child he was darn nearly blind and nobody knew it. Now those of you who worked with uh, handicapped children know that it's, this sort of phenomenon is quite common. Deaf children, they don't realize they're deaf. The parents don't. Deaf parents think they're stupid or something. They can't hear. So Bucky was nearly blind and they didn't really find out that he was four. And then he, saw, he started wearing these huge pebble glasses and said, my God, it's different out there. Now, when he was at infant school, before this was discovered, the teacher gave the class lumps of plasticine and sticks, reminiscent of anything, you see, and said, make something. Now, guess what the children all make if you tell them to do that at the age of four? Pardon? Sorry, too many people spoke at once. Spiders. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> oh, it's too complicated at that age. They build a house. See? They live in a kind of box with a roof, and they try and build a house. Now, this is about as unstable a structure as you can possibly have, of course. You make a cube and push it, it goes <laughs> instantly. Very unstable. 
And Buckminster Fuller's trying to make something with his hands. You see, he can't actually see. He doesn't know much about houses. And he built a tetrahedron. Now, that's, you know what that is. That's four sides, each of which is a triangle. So it's like a pyramid, only the base is triangular, not square. Now, you can push the hell out of this thing and it doesn't collapse. It's extremely sturdy. Teachers are totally amazed. And that's what set him off on, on these explorations of, of three-dimensional structures. Very, very fascinating. So, uh, getting back to your uh, question, uh, Claire, the, the, um, the variants are just enormous. Now, those are smaller numbers. If you get to about 25, we, we cannot prove what happens if some of these struts are missing. But it seems to be very robust, because sometimes people uh, get the flu and go home. It doesn't seem to matter. But this is not very scientific, you know, this is just our impression. Uh, now, what do you do if you've got uh, 150 people, and I've done that, um, you try and hold... Uh, getting late isn't it <laughs> five integrations you see then you've got the problem how do you put them together now you're all familiar with the idea of recursion by now supposing each one of these is an icosahedron imagine an icosahedron on here one of these next level of recursion uh, when you've held it you've got 12 statements Supposing you pull this icosahedron apart until it becomes a thin line and align the statements as best you may. So you, five statements get amalgamated here and seven get amalgamated here, let's say. Ideally six and six, I suppose. And then that becomes a strut of the next level of recursion. If you do that four times, you involve two and a half million people. How to run a country? It becomes plausible, doesn't it? Instead of sending delegates and all the chicanery that's involved in that, pretty interesting. So we started various experiments on those lines. Uh, the thing about this, I presume, is not only that they come up with a set of policies and plans to take them through the following year, but I presume they understand each other a lot better and... Mm. That That's period. the biggest payoff of all. Yeah. And this is what I was talking about, emphasetic consciousness, as I call it. Oh, I haven't introduced the word emphaset. That's an information set. So the 30 people are assumed to start with a certain sharing of knowledge, if they work for the same company, obviously. If they're members of the same political party, they've got a similar uh, thrust and motivation and party platform. Uh, and so on. So the infoset is supposed to have a certain cohesion before you start. Out of this comes infosetic consciousness, which is the consciousness of the totality, if this means anything. As I said, there's a whole, the book is in five parts, and there's part four is a discussion of this problem, and I, we can't really go into that now. But uh, it, it really is damn, damnably interesting. Very, very exciting to me. You talked about this for the level three, level four... Um, mm, homeostasis. Um, ...system. Um, would it not be quite valuable and quite useful for the uh, level three, uh, between level three and the level one management? I should have thought so. You see, the... The reason I mentioned the three four homeostat was that if I have been asked the question very often, how do you pull off this massive important i mean I've always emphasized the importance of the three four homeostat, then I'm asked how to pull it off. I've really no answer. you see well, now I have there are answers of many kinds to how you do the three one thing because it's much more established, but I would rather do it like this, of course I would. And then what about your customers, you see? I mean, going out this way of the model. Is a, take a system one, it goes to its environment and says, let's have this integration. We'll have five suppliers, five clients, five customers, um, 
five of the manufacturers from, from our own process, and so on. Why not do that? Now, I, I haven't had a chance to do this. I mean, good heavens, there's, there's so much that could be done. The trouble is they take an awful lot of arranging, you know. You've got to get 30 people. And Oh, I mentioned five days and people not liking it. We've managed to reduce it to three. But it means that you have to hold a meeting in, in 40 minutes and you better move. And so you have to beat gongs and we've had a lot of fun out of that because people people can see the problem, they join in, you know, and suddenly someone has got a saucepan and a <laughs> great spoon and is whacking it, blowing whistles, we've had it all. The, the difficulty with that is you've still got to take 30 people out of the business environment for three days. <laughs> That's, now you're talking like a good, solid, old-fashioned manager. That's exactly what they say. <laughs> the business has got to keep going. Absolutely so, but as I say, they'll all go off for a golf tournament. I mean, much of this is hoo-ha, isn't it? Much of it. But you're using this as, as, as a meeting technique for business and not for the business itself. Um, you've got a smaller variety of problems or issues to address than when Stafford's first thing was explained to us. I mean, you're not going to have somebody come in and say, pray. Well, <laughs> maybe if the company's about to go down the pants. But you're, you know, you're going to have every company, well, most companies, um, have ideas of the issues they need to address, especially if they're trying, whether they know it or not, they're trying to develop the system for homeostat. They, it may be their market, it may be their, their company structure, it may be, um, I don't know, I don't know, we can think of plenty of things. But if you, if, to start out with, if you could get these ideas or problems or issues sorted out, it would, it would save you time. Is that something you've done when you've gone? Have you taken this to, to companies? Yes, but I don't want to do that, if you'll excuse me saying so, no. uh, because this is like built drawing up the agenda in advance. You see, you're, 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 pre, you're, you're prejudging all sorts of things. I want to start with my statements of importance and the problem, Jocelyn, and see what emerges, you see. So I, my rule all the time in my own mind has been never do anything that is going to impose something that we can't be sure is a good idea. I would think with traditional companies this would be the worst problem. Oh, I think because it is. Say to certain mm. people, well, look, we want you to come away for three days, but we're not really going to tell you what we're going to talk mm. about. It's a devil of a problem. This is why yeah, we can't I'm sell it. <laughs> You've got to sort of say you've got to come on faith, and it's going to be worthwhile. It's about. <laughs> but this is true, you see, of all new ideas. If you just think about it, there's nothing novel about that. The, it's the proof that this is an, an innovation that that happens. It always does. Einstein announces the theory of relativity. Thirty years on, people are still saying he's nuts. Uh, people's the. Um, the president of the Royal Society in, in 1900 said that heavier than air flight was impossible. And with all the authority of the president of the Royal Society. I mean, he also said, by the way, that x-rays would prove to be a hoax. <laughs> I mean, it's just charming. And if, we, if you really have an innovation, you're going to be in dead schnook. And one has to face that. It's no use getting put down. Now, your only hope is that if you can make it stick in a few places, get it talked about, then it spreads like measles. Oh, yeah. But how long this takes is anybody's guess. I mean, I've been... I, I started publishing the VSM 30 years ago. It's fairly widespread now, but nothing like its full potential is... Nothing like it is realized anywhere. It, now, did you say that that there, in your early books, I know you said this wasn't... this concept, it hadn't come forward yet and developed yet. Is there anything written down about this? My new book. Your new book. Sold to the lady for £24.95. Oh. <laughs> 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 but Lena, would you mind getting it? I meant to bring it. Forgive me. Um, uh, the, the thing about cohesion, I'm interested because I've taken part in two of these. One was with an extremely cohesive group and it was absolutely fantastic. Oh, and it was just extraordinary. The second time was with a totally uncohesive group. There was nothing, absolutely nothing, that these people together. And 
it didn't work very well. How did they get together? Um, Joan, this graduate student, and me just desperately tried to get anyone we could think right. of and other people to, to, to join in. Right. Now, what I'm wondering is if. I'm sorry to keep giving these examples of Wales and politics, but it's <laughs> but it's all right. You decided that you wanted to get all the opposition parties in Wales to do one together. So maybe you'd have eight, um, so you've got, so let's say you had 12 Labour people, eight Clyde people, four Lib Dems, and however many I've got left, Green oh, Party, say. Or you might well have Tories as well, whatever. Then what you've got is you've got the cohesion that all these people are likely to be terribly tedious political hacks. That's the one thing they're going on. <laughs> but apart from that, that, you know, they are, you know, they spend their lives slacking each other off. And I'm just yeah. terribly interested. I would too. You better bring Guy Fawkes in on the act early. <laughs> Let him come. <laughs> yes, I do so agree with you. Well, you see, we, we've all sorts of plans like this. You take criminal justice. Uh, one of our uh, colleagues in Toronto is a QC, and he is passionately of the opinion that something needs to be done. Aren't we all? But, I mean, he's, he knows some people, you know, who hobnobs with judges. So our idea is uh, the same sort of thing. So you get five judges, five jurors, five ordinary citizens, five people out of a jail, and stir them up and see what will come of it. And the, the capacity of this thing to create new ideas is unbelievable. And then, and you were saying how, like, you get all the um, all the possible problems together, and then they talk about the ones that they like feel strongly about. Isn't there a danger that you'll end up with some of the maybe less important things because they're more interested, and there'll be a really big problem that's really important yes. and no one wants to tackle? Yes. And well, there, there is a, d a danger, but on the other hand, we're going to we're trying to assume that these people are serious uh, managers in the case of the company, and what you're not taking account of is the facilitation. Now, all these meetings have professional facilitators, and this is a subject you may not know anything about. Uh, there are now people who completely specialise in facilitating a meeting. Now, we are training our own facilitators. They're getting certified. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps certificated would be a better word, yes. <laughs> and, um, and they are being trained to do this job. Now, here's the book. Thanks to Elena, it's come. Recognize the cover this time. <laughs> this fellow. <laughs> And that has two critic, uh, four critic lines drawn in. Now, um, damn it. The microphones have gone as well. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Dear heaven. Topo topological murder here. Um, I thought I would like to read you the dedication, which comes from the book of Proverbs. And I've given it in Latin because I love biblical Latin, it's very nice. But on the uh, expectation that people won't be able to follow that, I'll give it you from the King James's version as we know it. He that answereth a matter before he heareth it, it is a folly and shame unto him. <laughs> I'm pleased with that. <laughs> I mean, uh, and I've said in the preface, this particularly applies to this idea of infocetic consciousness because everybody instantly says, I'm a psychologist and I'm telling you this. Yeah. So, there it is. Now, what did I set out to do? Uh, there, there are a number of appendices here. One gives the full mathematics of the eigenvalue stuff and will only be understood by a graduate mathematician. In the book itself, I have tried to explain this for someone who's probably done O-level maths, 
which is, I think, everybody nowadays, pretty nearly. Um, it's, it's really simplified. Uh, now, what I set out to tell you was what these, uh, what these extra chapters are at the end. The first one has got the mathematics in it. Uh, the second one uh, is the latest design for doing, doing this. Excuse me, by the managing director of our company, known as the president, of course, this being Canadian. The third is by Josephine Hancock and is the deals with this question of algorithms and why why it's thirty <laughs> factorial thirty times four million and what you do about it. Now the next one you see is our chief facilitator. Uh, the subtitle of which is a facilitator's perspective and his title is you drive for show but you putt for dough some golfers here <laughs> I didn't understand it either so that's all right he explains it the second facilitator who is also a director of the company is called subtitled another facilitator's perspective which I thought was funny um, <laughs> And that's called One Man's Signal is Another Man's Noise, which I like. And, uh, and then uh, comes the president again talking about how you can turn the results of this integration into workable plans, which is a very nice idea. And the final one is uh, Dana here uh, giving a very brief explanation of what the VSM is in order to make the point about the 3-4 homeostat stick because this book doesn't talk about the VSM at all. So there it is, and uh, it's just come out. I haven't seen a review yet. Very few people have got it. Um, well, yes, well, it arrived in the middle of this meeting. Don't you remember? I, I, I read a bit. Oh, yes. I don't, but Wiley's done. <laughs> well, right. I don't see why that shouldn't work between ourselves. <laughs> um, it will go to all the obvious publications, like all the systems magazines and so on. Um, Nina has offered to review it because she she reviews for the New Statesman. Did you know? So she's likely to do that, which would be quite nice, wouldn't it? So there are all the books. And this is the, I don't know if anybody's consulted this, this is the leaflet about all the paperbacks and so on. I would like you to, if, you, if you're likely to be interested, to, uh, to take one of those. I haven't got, I've, I think I bought four copies. Yeah. Um, you can consult all the books here, if you wish, and see what they look like. Probably put you off, of course, but there it is. I uh, thank you all so much for this because well, tomorrow's meeting is going to be yours so this is probably the moment for me to thank you. I think you've been a wonderful group and you've helped me to get through this whole explanation. That's probably the last time I'm going to do this, you know, because I'm fed up with it. <laughs> and the students will have to watch you grappling instead and then I will talk with them afterwards over a jar. That's my plan. <laughs>